Good afternoon, everybody. Um, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to the uh, third session today, uh, Africa-India Cooperation on Powering Africa, Strengthening the International Solar Alliance, and Africa-India Renewable Energy Partnerships. Uh, we have a very interesting uh, session lined up for all of you today. Uh, it's, uh, uh, we, of course, are awaiting uh, the minister as well, uh, both the ministers, actually, uh, Mr. Uh, Honorable Minister uh, Mr. Piyush Goel, as well as uh, the Chiman Bhai Saparia Ji, um, Mr. Banerjee for Gujarat, and uh, of course all the other panelists are here, uh, and we'll introduce them all to you as we go forward. Uh, my name is Sumant Sinha. I um, am the chairman and CEO of Renewable of Renew Power, which is one of India's largest renewable energy companies. Um, let me start off the session by giving a little bit of context before I welcome Mr. Yadav to um, give his welcome remarks. Uh, India has an ambitious program to install 175,000 megawatts of renewable energy capacity by 2022. And uh, that is a step towards fulfilling India's energy security as well as combating climate change. The 175 gigawatt target includes 100 gigawatts of solar, 60 gigawatts of wind, uh, 10 gigawatts from biomass, and the balance of small hydropower plants. Um, the rise in power capacity addition is only to keep up to the rising energy demand. India is the only country where energy demand is likely to quadruple in uh, the medium term. As the Indian market ramps up, it will become a key pillar for demand growth when demand in other leading countries, including Japan, China, and even possibly the USA is expected to slow down. Um, going forward, India will look to have an established solar market. Further, India aims to be a global player in the power value chain and strives to not only improve the energy availability, accessibility, and affordability for its own citizens, but also to cater to the developing world. Uh, over the last few years, as all of you would know, uh, solar tariffs in India have gone to uh, much lower levels than we had seen earlier. And the last bid that we had in Badla was uh, uh, at rupees 244, uh, which are, in fact, rates that you might argue are even cheaper than any uh, thermal capacity that we've seen recently. Um, We've had several different types of tenders that have happened so far, uh, most notably the Reva uh, auction, uh, where uh, there were three unique features in this tender. Uh, one, we had interstate open access sales of about 25% of the power to Delhi Metro Rail. Um, we also had uh, certain commitments given in terms of backing down in, in the sense that that wasn't allowed. And the state government also had given a guarantee on that particular project. And that actually is what allowed tariffs to come down to this uh, fairly substantial level. Uh, the other thing that is also happening is that uh, uh, technology has really come, has really improved dramatically. And uh, a lot of the reduction in tariff is also on account of the cost of uh, uh, technology going down. And as the risk reduces further and familiarity with solar technologies improve, uh, financing costs are also likely to head downwards and therefore actually bring down the cost of solar even more as we go forward. Uh, so there are quite a few things that uh, uh, the Indian government is doing on the financing front as well, uh, which of course I'm sure that uh, uh, the people from the government will, will talk about uh, fairly soon. Uh, I think the important thing to mention here is that uh, as a country, we have taken very uh, strong steps on furthering our journey on the solar path, and we have now uh, got well on our way to uh, get into about 20 gigawatts of installed capacity uh, by the end of this financial year and adding 10 to 15 gigawatts every year after that. And that is really developing a full ecosystem uh, of uh, players in India, of financing, uh, of R&D. Uh, of course, more needs to be done on the R&D front. Uh, but certainly in the entire business value chain, there's a lot of work that has gone on. And the question now is, of course, for Indian companies and uh, for us as to how we can leverage the platform of the International Solar Alliance um, and how using that can India and Africa work together to reduce the cost of financing even further and undertake joint research uh, and development for developing and improving specific areas of solar technologies that can be used to deploy solar much more widely in African countries as well. Uh, and this alliance, our view is, uh, will pave the way for innovation in production technologies and storage of solar energy to ensure affordable, continuous, and sustainable supply. Uh, we also believe that Africa and India can co collaborate much better in uh, areas of uh, training, building institutions, regulatory issues, developing common standards, and investments, including in joint ventures. 
uh, and our view is that this would actually help a lot of the African economies uh, as well uh, enjoy the kind of benefits that India is getting from the growth of solar. So I think that is just to set a bit of context uh, of the ISA and the kind of work that is happening in India and what we can do in Africa as well. Um, and, and just to take that theme forward, I'd like to welcome Mr. Bhanu Pratav Yadav, who is the Joint Secretary in the Ministry of uh, New and Renewable Energy Government of India, to give his welcome remarks and uh, enlighten us a little bit more as to what uh, the ISA could be doing going forward. Mr. Yadav, I'd like to welcome you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sinha. His Excellency, Mr. Ahmad Saeed Hasani Zafar, Vice President, Republic of Comoro. Mr. Shastri, Head R&D of ISA. Mr. Patrick Pilon, Deputy to Head of Regional Economic Service, Regional Financial Counselor, Embassy of France in India. Mr. Sebastian Boriu, Deputy Head of International Finance Department, French Treasury. We just uh, have Honorable uh, Minister, Mr. Piyush Goel, Minister of State for Independent Charge of New and Renewable Energy, Power, Mines and Coal. Uh, I also welcome uh, Honorable Mr. Chiman Bhai Sapariya, Minister of Agriculture and Energy, Government of Gujarat. I welcome the panelist, uh, Mr. Zahanon Marsin Sise, Director General, Aid Strategy Coordination, Ministry of Planning and Development, Republic of Kut Devre. Mr. Gurdeep Singh, Chairman and Managing Director, NTPC. On behalf of Government of India and the Government of Gujarat, which is the local host, I welcome all of you to this morning session of Africa-India Cooperation Empowering Africa, Strengthening ISA and Africa-India-RE Partnership. Africa faces an enormous energy challenge like what we used to face a few years back in our growth journey. Its growing population and economic progress has sent energy demand soaring. This calls for a rapid increase in supply on the continent to which all forms of energy must contribute in the decades ahead. Africa, therefore, has a unique opportunity to pursue sustainable energy development as a basis for long-term prosperity. We understand that Africa is richly endowed both with fossil fuel and renewable energy sources. However, a continued reliance on oil and gas along with traditional biomass co combustion for energy will bring con considerable social, economic, and environmental constraints. Tackling today's energy challenge on the continent, therefore, requires a firm commitment to the accelerated use of modern renewable energy sources. Renewable energy is growing rapidly around the world, driven by economics, environmental concerns, and need for energy security. The use of modern renewable energy technologies is also on the rise across Africa, where uh, countries are uniquely positioned to leapfrog the traditional centralized energy supply model. The cost of renewable technologies are decreasing on a global scale, both we've experienced uh, uh, in India as well as uh, um, uh, countries in Africa. While the resource base varies, all the African countries possess significant renewable energy potential. The continents, biomass, geothermal, hydropower, solar, and wind energy sources are amongst the best in the world. There was a study that a small portion of Sahara Desert can meet entire energy demand of Europe through solar power. We at India has traversed the path and overcome the energy shortages, differences in demand and supply, quality of power, rural electrification. We've enhanced its transition net uh, transmission network and improved our distribution efficiencies. Of these improvements, significant enhancement in renewable energy has become core theme for its sustainability and for well-being of our future generation. We upped our renewable energy target to 175 gigawatt to be achieved in 2022, and we are steadily moving in that direction. As a part of our efforts towards international cooperation in terms of renewable energy, namely solar, international solar has been our focus for the last couple of years. 
It was launched jointly by our Prime Minister and President of France in 30th November 2015. Many countries have signed the framework agreement. Today is also an opportunity to become partners in that journey. Today we will also witness the launch of third ISA program, scaling up mini-grids and micro-grids jointly by India and France. With such renowned and knowledgeable panelists, I will not take much of your time and today's session, uh, hope that today's session goes a long way in strengthening the joint India-Africa Renewable Energy Partnership. With this, I invite uh, Mr. A.K. Tripathi for a small film on India's RE journey. Thank you. Thank you, sir. The India started its journey in 1982. And today, the India has witnessed an exponential growth in renewable energy sector. Today, with over 57 gigawatt installed capacity, the India contributes to close to 18% in the total installed capacity term. I'll take you to the journey of India's renewable energy. Bright sunshine for around 300 days in a year. Swift winds over most of the geographical area. Numerous powerful water streams in hilly regions and abundant greenery all over. Mother Nature has bestowed a bounty of natural resources to India. The exponential growth in population followed by urbanization and industrialization are increasing the demand of power day by day. Hence, India developed a strategy and roadmap to explore and exploit renewable sources of energy to power its dream of sustainable growth. A separate department of non-conventional energy sources was created in 1982, which was upgraded as an exclusive, dedicated and federal ministry in 1992, which was re-christened as Ministry of New and Renewable Energy in 2006. Recent resource assessments indicate India has over 1,000 gigawatt potential of renewable power from wind, solar, biomass and small hydropower. On the global platform of UN Climate Change Summit at Paris, India committed to reduce the emission intensity of GDP. We have set ambitious targets. By 2030, we will reduce emissions by 33 to 35 percent of 2005 levels and produce 40 percent of our power from non-fossil fuels. Government upscaled the target of renewable energy capacity to 175 gigawatt by 2022, which includes solar, wind, biopower and small hydropower. Ministry of New and Renewable Energy, MNRE, launched a national solar mission in 2010 with 20 gigawatt target, which has now been enhanced to 100 gigawatt. Conducive policies, favorable and friendly regulations for purchase of solar power, common acquisition of land and infrastructure development have facilitated the growth of solar power and establishment of 34 solar parks in 21 states with aggregate capacity of 20 gigawatt government has recently launched second phase with additional 20 gigawatt capacity today india takes pride in commissioning the world's largest solar park of 1000 megawatt in karnool andhra pradesh the solar power has attained grid parity in India. The levelized tariff of solar power, which was once about 30 US cents or over 17 Indian rupees per unit, has come down to less than 4 US cents or 2.5 Indian rupees per unit. Under Make in India, high quality solar photovoltaic cells, modules, Systems and devices are being manufactured at competitive prices. In rural India, a special scheme for installation of over 100,000 solar water pumps is transforming the agricultural scenario and also easing accessibility to drinking water. Off-grid solar plants, LED solar home lights, solar lanterns, 
LED solar street lights being installed in rural and urban areas are transforming the quality of life. Over 1 million solar lamps have been distributed to students of tribal and backward communities in over 10,000 villages. A skilled workforce of over 11,000 Suramitras against targeted 50,000 are already providing the services for technical solutions in field. Policy facilitations, easy and low cost of financing have created a wave of solar rooftops across the country. Small and large urban dwelling units, institutions, airports, railway stations, defense establishments, industry and other government establishments are installing and enjoying the benefits of solar rooftops through net metering mechanism. An innovative step has been taken to utilize vast area of canal banks and canal tops for installing solar projects. No wonder, now India proudly hosts world's largest solar rooftop installation of 12.5 megawatt on a single roof at Dera Bias in Punjab. MNRE supports and promotes emerging concentrated solar thermal technology for various thermal applications in urban India, which include industries, dairy and other enterprises. In wind energy sector, latest estimates at 100 meter level put pan-India potential at more than 302 gigawatt. Business potential and lucrative returns have made wind power a champion, having large share in the total installed capacity of renewables. India has reached wind manufacturing capacity of 10,000 megawatt per annum. The country has developed a manufacturing base of international quality at competitive prices, with indigenization reaching to over 70%. Manufacturers are offering a wide range of turbines with over 55 models of capacities ranging from 225 kilowatt to 3 megawatt. Moving further, MNRE has taken steps for repowering of old turbines and exploration of offshore wind energy. Unique intervention of e-reverse auction is proving its worth by discovering lowest tariff of Rs 3.46 per unit for 1000 megawatt wind power projects. Now, India is the fourth largest producer of wind power in the world. Ministry is promoting renovation of existing old water mills for grinding floor and also generate electricity for individual households and cluster of villages. Government is encouraging foreign investors to set up renewable power projects in India with 100% foreign direct investment. In hilly and difficult terrains, small hydropower units up to 25 megawatt are proving their worth by providing clean power at affordable cost. With quick capacity additions, nearly 4,400 megawatt capacity has been installed so far. In rural areas, nearly 50 lakh improved biogas plants are providing clean fuel for cooking and power generation. Similarly, Improved biomass cook stoves for domestic and community cooking are conserving greenery and also saving women from drudgery of collecting fuel wood from distances. Bagars based cogeneration in sugar mills are producing enough power to meet the electricity requirements of the mills. Besides, surplus power is sold to power grid for additional income. Improved biomass power plants producing power mainly from agricultural residues and wastes have been installed by large number of private enterprises. Urban solid wastes are proving a boon for generating electricity through waste to energy projects. India has over 57 gigawatt renewable power which accounts for 18% of total installed capacity. Over the years, MNRE has built up a robust institutional infrastructure and network for providing policy development and R&D support to its schemes and programs. As an emerging leader of renewable energy on the global map, India has developed competencies to offer consultancy service for installation of renewable power projects, renewable energy resource assessment, monitoring and evaluations of renewable energy projects, appropriate technologies for wide-scale adoption and 
specific R&D projects on turnkey basis. India has also led to the creation and launch of international solar alliance with 121 solar resource rich countries as members. No doubt, India has the makings of becoming the world capital of green energy and is heading towards realizing the dream of clean, green and affordable power to all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, very nice film. Uh, <clears throat> may I now request Mr. Agrim Kaushal, Economic Advisor to the ISA Secretariat, to uh, help us with the launch of the third ISA program on scaling up mini grids and micro grids. Mr. Kaushal. Uh, Honorable Minister, uh, Honorable uh, Vice President, uh, Republic of Comoros, dignitaries on the dais, and esteemed guests. Yes. It is a proud moment for the International Solar Alliance Secretariat to announce the launch of its third program, Scaling Solar Mini Grids. The third program is an attempt to address the challenge of bringing uh, uh, solar energy into the sparsely populated and unconnected uh, island and small uh, member states. The main activities under the program include deploying nano, small, mini, and solar grids, and also uh, innovating financial uh, uh, payment uh, mechanisms such as pay as you go. The consultation process with the national focal points uh, which started on 24th of April has been uh, successfully completed. May I now request Honorable Shri Piyush Goel to unveil the program. I also request the French side, Mr. Patrick Pilon, to come forward. Can you please bring the blue? Envelopes. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Koshal. Um, I'd now like to uh, invite Honorable Minister Sri Piyush Goelji to come and address uh, us before we have a panel discussion after that. Please. Thank you very much, Sumant. Your Excellency, Mr. Ahmed Said Hassani Jaffer, the Honorable Vice President of the Republic of Comoros, Chiman Bhai Sapariyaji, Honorable Minister of Agriculture and Energy in the Government of Gujarat, Shri Gurdeep Singh, Chairman and Managing Director, NTPC, Shri Suman Sinha, Chairman of the CII Committee on Renewable Energy, and Founder Chairman of Renew Power Ventures, Mr. Zahanon Marcelin Sisse, 
Director General, Aid Strategy and Coordination, Ministry of Planning and Development, Republic of Cote d'Ivoire. Other senior dignitaries on the desk from the African Development Bank, dignitaries from the Government of India, from several African states, ladies and gentlemen. Indo-African partnership is not based on strategic intent, but on historical and cultural ties and shared values and goals where the people of both these continents, the African continent and the Indian subcontinent, go back into history for thousands of years. It is reported that long back, Africa and India were united by land. Now we are separated by the seas, but united by a common purpose, a purpose of fighting poverty, a purpose of promoting progress, justice, peace, and prosperity for the people of both regions. In fact, uh, Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi, the father of our nation, and the son of the soil from the state of Gujarat came from Africa and became Mahatma, the man who brought freedom to our country. Nelson Mandela took forward this invaluable legacy. In fact, India was also a key anti-apartheid voice and anti-colonial voice over the years in the African subcontinent. And therefore, this common shared desire for ensuring social justice for our people, after centuries of exploitation by foreign powers, can best be achieved by greater cooperation, greater economic and people-to-people -people ties. Because what we can understand, the shared pain of our history, what we can understand as the shared concerns that poverty brings to nations and the development of nations is very difficult for any other country to appreciate and understand. In fact, on several international platforms, I have seen a tendency to almost gloat over the fact that some nations have provided a small thing like a solar lamp to villages in Africa. In today's day and age, when the world is connected through internet, when the world is connected through communication of television and radio, where electricity is no more a luxury, it's almost a necessity, and where the sustainable development goal number seven is talking of affordable and quality energy access for every global citizen by 2030. I don't think we can rest on our achievement of having connected a poor household and remote village in Africa just by a solar lamp. We ourselves have a lot of remote areas, remote villages, citizens living on the top of mountains or in dense forests who over seven decades have not been benefited by electricity. But we are not looking at keeping them deprived for long. The Honorable Prime Minister of India has a vision that by 2022, when India turns 75 years of independence, every home in this country should be connected to electricity, should have the benefit of electricity. On a more personal note, I'm trying to do it much faster. The entire government of India, along with the states, is working to see, can we achieve this by 2019? Why even 2022? Because after all, every single day that we keep that child in that remote village deprived of electricity, is one more day gone in the life of a poor person's future, in the ability of that family 
to join the national mainstream and get a better quality of life, meet the aspirations of those people. And therefore, even in very remote areas where the grid cannot reach well in time to take electricity, we are looking at providing a holistic solar energy solution where we'll have sufficient capacity in the home system to not only power maybe five LED lights, which can ensure there's brightness and light through the whole evening, a ceiling fan and the lights and fan we give along with the solar system, a battery backup, which can ensure eight hours of supply, even when the sun is not there, in fact, uh, we are also adding a 24-inch LED television because we believe that it's the nation's debt of gratitude, a payback time for these citizens who have been deprived of electricity for so many years. We want them to be connected not just through mobile technology, but also to learn about what's happening in the world. We are looking at taking digital to every corner, nook and corner of the country so that the children, even in the remotest parts of India, can enjoy the fruits of what's happening in the world of modern technology. And I think that's the vision that India wishes to offer to the people of Africa, to the African nations. And through this engagement, where we are looking at strengthening the International Solar Alliance and the Africa-India Renewable Energy Partnership, we believe that the learnings that India has had over the last three years in rapidly scaling up our renewable energy capacity, in rapidly reaching out to those remote villages where electricity was never there for seven decades, in ensuring household connectivity so that every home in the country benefits from electricity largely through the electricity grid, but even in remote areas through off-grid solutions. And we would love to share our experiences to work together with the African continent and all the countries of Africa to take the benefits of modern technology, to take the benefits of low-cost deployment of this technology on a larger scale to the remotest corners of Africa, to the poorest of poor of Africa, furthering the dream and the vision of Pandit Dindyal Upadhyay, a great thinker of his times who over 50 years ago had articulated the philosophy that the nation's resources should first be used to serve the poorest of the poor, the person at the bottom of the pyramid. And taking that forward, the Honorable Prime Minister's vision is that our programs, our learnings, our technologies, even our finances, when they go to Africa, when they are focused towards development of the African countries, should work to serve the poorest of the poor so that people in Africa also can enjoy the shared prosperity that I believe is the right of every global citizen in this modern day and age. In fact, uh, uh, Mr. Boutros, Boutros Ghali, the Secretary General of the UN, who is of Egyptian origin, had commented that cooperative enterprises provide the organizational means whereby a significant proportion of humanity is able to take into its own hands the tasks of creating productive employment, overcoming poverty, and achieving social integration. And I think providing electricity to every citizen of Africa will become the fulcrum around which we can ensure holistic development of the citizens of Africa. Uh, Nelson Mandela had once said, after climbing a great hill, one only finds that there are many more hills to climb. But the choices of all of us, whether we are going to rest with our achievements in our own country, or we are going to take that to other areas which need the same level of development. And I think India, 
and the Honorable Prime Minister Shri Narendra Modi has made that choice. He believes that renewable energy, clean energy is important for sustainable lifestyles, for sustainable growth, for protecting the planet and for leaving behind for our children a better planet to live in. Because after all, we are all trustees who have inherited the earth only to make it better for our next generation, not to mess it up any further. And in that spirit of cooperation and trusteeship, India would like to offer its partnership. And the African Development Bank has, very, uh, has been very cooperative and has agreed to be a partner in this, in this effort to engage with Africa to expand our partnership to industrialize and take electricity to every part of Africa. The Ministry of Finance, led by Mr. Arun Jetli, who was here yesterday, has uh, earmarked a significant portion of the line of credit that has, to, that has been offered to African nations. The $10 billion line of credit that was uh, finalized in the last Indo-African uh, summit, almost 15 to 20 percent of that, that's about a billion and a half to two billion, have been earmarked to help the African nations improve their grid connectivity to, uh, to reach power to remote areas, but also largely to support taking power into remote areas through off-grid and renewable energy sources. We have had some very good successes in bringing down the cost of renewable energy. In fact, today our renewable energy cost is below grid parity. It's cheaper than thermal power for us to generate solar or wind power in India. And we are looking at expanding our own renewable energy capacity, as was just now shown on the film, to never before levels. India has embarked possibly on the world's largest scale up of renewable energy, because as Prime Minister Modi says, the environment and protecting the environment is an article of faith for him personally and for the people of India. It's not something that America or any other country, the Western world, is telling us to do. It's something that India believes in intrinsically. It's something that comes naturally to every Indian, particularly when we look at India's history where the environment always was nurtured, where the environment was almost revered over our 5,000-year history, over our mythology. We have even prayed to the wind god. We have even prayed to the sun god. We have even respected our rivers, our forests. And I think taking that legacy forward, India plans to roll out renewable energy on a very fast-track mission mode. And we would very much like to be a part of that development process, take our experiences and our industry to work in Africa, not with sympathy. I believe this is not something which comes out of sympathy. Sympathy is something which is drawn out when, you, when there is a difference between the thinking of two people. There can be sympathy between one and the other. For India, this is a partnership out of empathy. It's a partnership where two countries and the people of two regions work as brothers and sisters, work together as one family, where we work together knowing our own history and understanding what is happening in the African continent. And with that understanding, with that appreciation of the ground reality, I believe India is best poised to be able to play a very important role. We have had our own engagement through the solar mamas who have been trained in solar fabrication, installation, and other aspects of solar energy under Government of India sponsored programs. We have had an experience to take the barefoot women vocational training college to the Zanzibar islands of Tanzania and other countries in Africa. And I believe now 
we should look at scaling up this engagement, be it in skill development, be it in expanding your microgrids or even utility scale renewable energy programs, be it in introducing the most modern technologies in Africa, be it in helping you to assemble in the initial stage and finally manufacture solar and wind generating equipment. And my belief is that when we work together, we'll reach much farther. When we work alone, there is only so far that we can go. But when we work together as a team, we can do much more and have exponential growth. And within that, and to enable that growth, we have created the International Solar Alliance as a platform where we can share experiences, as a platform for research and development, for technology sharing, as a platform which can help you create good financing models which can help you raise the necessary finances to expand your clean energy and energy access program. And I would urge all the countries of the African continent to quickly join the International Solar Alliance, enjoy the fruits and benefits of this partnership through the International Solar Alliance platform. 15 African nations have already signed the ISA. I think it will help African countries to reduce their cost of renewable energy, to arrange for affordable finance at low, uh, low cost of finance. It will help get better and newer technologies to Africa, certainly leading to universal energy access for all the people of Africa, not by 2030, as envisaged under the SDG 7, but much earlier, because I believe the people of Africa if they have to come out of the poverty trap, will have to first benefit from availability of low cost, affordable, quality and reliable, adequate energy, adequate electricity. I believe this partnership under the aegis of the African Development Bank, together with the Ministry of Finance in India and guided by the Ministry of Renewable Energy in India, together, can become a game changer, can take the African nations to the next step of development, of economic development, of industrialization much faster. I invite all the African nations and I invite all the delegates from different nations in Africa to take this message of the International Solar Alliance to your countries, to the governments in your countries, engage with the, the ISA, join the ISA, ratify the treaty, and become partner countries, member countries of the ISA, so that together we can make history, we can create a better future for the people of our countries. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. And thanks to the African Development Bank for organizing this wonderful interaction. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, uh, Minister, for that address. Um, it was very, uh, very, very insightful and gave us a good perspective on how India and Africa can, uh, can work together with each other, particularly in the context of the ISA. Um, we are now uh, going to have a panel discussion uh, with some of the participants who are sitting here. Um, I will just introduce them quickly, and I will request each of the panelists to make uh, remarks of a few minutes as we're running a little bit behind schedule. Um, and then we'll have an address by um, uh, Mr. Chiman Bhai Saparia, the Minister of Agriculture and Energy, the government of Gujarat, as well as by uh, Mr. Hassani Jafar, the Vice President of the Republic of Comoros. Uh, and in the panel discussion, uh, I would uh, request if both the ministers and, uh, uh, and, and if you sir can jump in at any point in time if you want to uh, make any points or contribute anything to the discussion, uh, we would most welcome that. Uh, the participants that we have in the panel discussion today are Mr. O.S. Shastri, uh, sitting to my right. Uh, he's the head of R&D uh, at the Interim Secretariat of the International Solar Alliance. We have uh, uh, Ms. Astrid Manroth, sitting to my immediate right. Uh, she is Director for Transformative Energy Partnerships, the African Development Bank. Uh, we have, to her right, uh, 
uh, Mr. Zahanon Marcelin Sise. Uh, he is the Director General for Aid Strategy and Coordination, Ministry of Planning and Development, Republic of Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, and then we have Mr. Gurdeep Singh, who is the Chairman and Managing Director of the National Thermal Power Corporation. Uh, we also have sitting on the dais along with us, Mr. Patrick Pion. Uh, he is the Deputy to the Head of Regional Economic Services, Regional Financial Counselor, the Economic and Financial Division, uh, the Embassy of France in India. And we also have Mr. Sebastian Boro, <laughs> uh, Deputy Head of International Finance Department, uh, French Treasury, the Government of France. Um, so without any further ado, let me request uh, Mr. Shastri uh, to please uh, tell us a little bit about what is happening on the R&D front and how uh, we can work more closely with Africa in this endeavor. Yeah, very good morning. Um, uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity. Uh, you know, uh, ISA is a treaty-based organization, and then we have several organizations like this and ISA in the, in the energy space. We have IRENA now. We are, so what is ISA new about that? If you look at that, ISA is the only or unique organization particularly devoted to solar, whereas other organizations do renewable energy, of course, energy and as a part of that. So now, uh, and then the major is ISA is an action oriented. What I mean to say is it's not simply preparing a report or putting on the website or posting some. It is you have to hand holding right from the beginning of the project generation and then till the successful end of the project. That's what we are going to do in the ISA. And ISA, incidentally, it's not a bank, but we are trying to mobilize funds to the level of thousand billion US dollars. That's what the state. And how do we do it? Well, aggregation of the demand, that is the most important and the fundamental principle that we are working on in ISA. If you have a small, perhaps nobody listen to you, but when you aggregate, when you grow bigger, and then perhaps everything that will, uh, will be heard and listened. For example, if you have a thousand pumps or a thousand uh, street lights, nobody will change their uh, pattern or the designs and other things. But you have one lakh, one lakh fifty thousand pumps, definitely will listen. Not only that, at this stage I would like to just simply identify as of now, most of the development has taken place in Europe and other things. But the site conditions, socio-economic conditions, use patterns are totally different, particularly for Africa and US, uh, India. Fortunately, India and Africa has to some extent, similar uh, 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 environment conditions. We are arid zones, hot, hotter, hottest, or high humid. So are the composite climate. This governs at least 80 to 90% of our this thing. So all those systems, standards, test, message, test procedures, installation, even the selection of a technology should be Keeping in this in mind, in fact, the reliability mostly depends on this particular condition. So what we are trying to do in ISA is develop our own standards. And then, apart from that, we are also trying to look for the capacity building. Capacity building means not only the training, you train the manpower, and then also see how you can have your own test facilities, how you can have your own uh, other system facilities, installations, and see how the yields can be improved. And at the same time, you can see how the cost can be brought down. That, if I have any questions, I would like to answer more. I will then come to Okay. Thank you, Mr. Shastri. Uh, could I request uh, Ms. Astrid Manroth, um, tell us a little bit about uh, perhaps uh, financing issues for financing renewable energy projects in Africa, is that something that you're already doing a lot of? Uh, what are the challenges and issues that you and the opportunities that you might foresee in that area? Thank you very much. Good morning, all. And I really would like to start by, first of all, thanking the government of India and Gujarat State for, for hosting our annual meetings this year. I think it's a very pleasant experience and a wonderful organization and a wonderful opportunity for all of us coming from Africa to really meet with all of you from India. Um, and there is so much experience here. I mean, I have learned tons over the last three days already um, that I think we're very well equipped to take this back to Africa and also see how we can partner on a, on a long, longer uh, term horizon. 
So with regards to what we do in renewable energy, let me just take you back to the starting point. We still have over 600 million of Africans that don't have access to electricity. And as our president likes to say, development doesn't happen in the dark. And that's why actually it is no coincidence that the first of the high fives of our strategy is power and light up Africa. Because we all agree that this is a necessary input into feeding Africa, into industrializing Africa. And as a strategic objective, um, the underpinning New Deal on Energy for Africa has actually set out to achieve universal access for energy for all Africans by 2025. So as the Honorable Minister said, five years before the SDG 7 target, again, because we are in a hurry and we need to jointly work together to combat poverty. So in the context of the New Deal, we've set ourselves ambitious targets. We want to add 160 gigawatts of additional generation capacity, and a large share of this will come from renewable energy. We want that to translate into 130 million on-grid connections and also 75 million of off-grid connections. And we also would like to see um, significant scaling up in access to clean cooking solutions. So as you can see, it is really an integrated strategy where renewable will play a center role. So to date, the bank has focused more on larger scale renewable energy projects. To give you an example, we have been involved in Wazazate, which is the largest solar complex in Africa right now. And we have also been involved in the Lake Turkana wind project, which is the largest wind project in Africa. But as the Honorable Minister said, on-grid solutions are not the only part of the equation. So that's why in March we have actually launched the off-grid revolution, really looking at how we can significantly scale up access to financing for solar home systems in remote rural areas. And I think perhaps one of the differences between Africa and India is that in some African regions you have a very sparse population density. So from our continent, the case for extending the grid is even less economic than it might be in some of the remote regions in, in India. So what we are aiming to do is really twofold. First of all, work with countries to help them what we call integrated access compacts. Um, and that really starts with integrated planning. Be clear where it makes sense to extend the grid and where actually off-grid solutions are more economic and more advantageous. And then on the financing side, when we look at the on-grid solutions, we would like to see much more private sector capital flowing into this. So we're looking at um, scaling up the use of our guarantee instruments for on-grid independent power producers to attract more finance at scale into these solutions. And on the off-grid side, we're really looking for a financing revolution as well. And we see that as a combination of several factors. We're currently putting in place two investment vehicles. Um, one is the Fund for Energy Inclusion that will provide debt financing to small-scale IPPs and mini-grid operators. And another window is the, the off-grid um, energy access fund, which is really targeting at scaling up solar home systems across the continent. Obviously, training is an important area of making all of this work. And I think here, again, we can learn a lot from the approach in India. Um, I was recently, actually on Sunday, I visited with some of our colleagues here, the one megawatt um, solar installation at the local university here in Gujarat, which I understand was the pilot installation for the country. And I mean, look where you have come from, from there. So um, I think we, we definitely need your support in training and skilling Africans. And obviously, we're extremely grateful for the up to two billion dollars that has been earmarked for support to renewable energy in Africa. And again, I think it, we can use this in a combination of co-financing larger scale renewable energy projects across the continent, but then also really in making the financial transformation happen for off-grid. And this takes slightly different financing models, you know, where you, some subordinated capital may be necessary in order to get commercial banks and private investors comfortable with this new technology that, however, really Op uh, offers an opportunity to leapfrog. So let me stop here, but say again, thank you for, for these wonderful days, and I look forward to putting the South-South partnership into action to light up and power Africa. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that fascinating uh, input. Uh, may I now request Mr. Zahano and Marcelin Cisse to make his comments and tell us about what might be happening in Cote d'Ivoire?
Merci, monsieur le, le modérateur. Euh, monsieur le ministre, honorables invités, mesdames et messieurs, euh, avant tout profond, nous voulons remercier les, le gouvernement indien et les organisateurs de nous avoir associés à cette importante rencontre. Comme vous le savez, euh, notre vice-président accompagne la délégation ivoirienne au cours de ses assemblées et il y a eu des échanges au plus haut niveau avec le premier ministre indien sur le renforcement de la coopération entre la Côte d'Ivoire et l'Inde. Comme vous le savez, sous la haute égide de son excellence Alassane Ouattara, président de la République de Côte d'Ivoire, la Côte d'Ivoire ambitionne de devenir un pays émergent. Alors, on l'a dit tantôt, et celui, celle qui m'a précédé l'a rappelé, on ne peut pas faire le développement dans le noir. Nous ne pouvons pas amorcer un processus de transformation structurelle de notre économie si nous n'avons pas euh, les capacités énergétiques qui s'adaptent aux besoins de notre économie. C'est fort de cela que son excellent le président de la République s'est fixé comme objectif de faire de la Côte d'Ivoire un hub énergétique. Nous sommes passés d'environ 1400 d'une capacité de production de 1400 MW en 2011 à près de 2000 MW en 2016. Et nous ambitionnons de doubler cette capacité énergétique à l'horizon 2020 pour passer à 4000 MW. Vous voyez, c'est un objectif ambitieux. La Côte d'Ivoire exporte déjà de l'énergie aux pays de la sous-région, le Ghana, le Burkina, euh, le Mali. Il euh, y a l'interconnexion entre la Côte d'Ivoire, le Libéria et la Guinée. Vous voyez, c'est un programme qui est ambitieux. Il est bien entendu, nous ne pouvons pas continuer à compter sur la, pro la production énergétique conventionnelle. C'est pour cette raison que la Côte d'Ivoire, euh, qui ambitionne bien entendu de doubler sa capacité énergétique, veut faire, dans le cadre de sa stratégie, monter en puissance dans le mix énergétique de l'hydraulique dont la part doit passer de 30% à 45% en 2020, auxquels s'ajouteront 5% d'autres sources renouvelables. Et ce sera essentiellement le solaire. Il s'agira, dans les perspectives pour nous, de porter d'ici 2030 les énergies renouvelables à 16%. Dans le mix énergétique, hors les programmes euh, hydroélectriques. Ce qui permettra, je pense que M. le ministre l'a dit tantôt, ce qui permettra de réduire la part du thermique de 50% et d'alléger la facture du gaz. Alors, je voulais dire que euh, les énergies renouvelables sont aussi importantes dans la stratégie du gouvernement aujourd'hui que de, depuis le mois de janvier, il y a eu un remaniement du gouvernement et on a associé au portefeuille du ministre de l'énergie la stratégie de développement des énergies renouvelables pour montrer que la Côte d'Ivoire veut marquer le pas avec le développement des énergies renouvelables. Alors, l'accroissement des infrastructures de production d'énergie renouvelable demandera pour le gouvernement, bien entendu, d'investir et surtout d'évaluer les jugements national de ressources d'énergie renouvelable destinés aux énergies renouvelables. Il est nécessaire également de mettre en place des projets importants structurants de centrales solaires photovoltaïques et à biomasse de cacao. Comme vous le savez, la Côte d'Ivoire est le premier producteur mondial de cacao. Et comme vous le savez, quand vous cassez le cacao, les cabos, vous les jetez. Nous sommes également le premier producteur mondial de noix de cajou. Et quand vous les cassez, c'est des éléments que vous jetez. Alors nous voulons développer l'énergie à base de biomasse. Nous avons aujourd'hui en Côte d'Ivoire, la Côte d'Ivoire dispose de près de 12 millions de tonnes de déchets agricoles. Ces déchets agricoles sont un potentiel important de développement des énergies renouvelables en Côte d'Ivoire. Je pense que euh, globalement, c'est un peu ça la stratégie qui est en train d'être développée en Côte d'Ivoire. Nous sommes arrivés, il y a eu des échanges au plus haut niveau avec le gouvernement indien. Nous voyons qu'il y a euh, beaucoup 
à, à tirer ici de l'expérience indienne. Et bien entendu, la Côte d'Ivoire se fera fort dans la stratégie de développement de ces énergies renouvelables de tirer euh, le meilleur parti de l'expérience indienne. Alors, je dois euh, ajouter à cela que nous sommes déjà, dans le cadre de la coopération avec l'Inde, nous développons déjà le village euh, biotechnologique et il y a également des partenariats importants avec le secteur privé indien. Je pense que dans le cadre des énergies renouvelables, il y a un potentiel important pour renforcer cette coopération avec l'Inde pour tirer parti de son expérience. Alors, on l'a dit, quels, sont, quels pourront être les chantiers de, de coopération On a parlé, euh, euh, avant de le dire, avant de dire les chantiers de coopération, nous avons signé euh, avant-hier, nous avons ratifié euh, euh, l'Alliance sur l'énergie solaire. La Côte d'Ivoire est l'un des pays qui vient de ratifier l'énergie solaire pour montrer notre ferme volonté de développer, d'adhérer à, à, à ce mécanisme et de développer les énergies euh, 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 solaires, les énergies renouvelables. Et bien entendu, les chantiers de coopération pour nous, on a parlé de la recherche-développement, nous avons parlé du renforcement des capacités, nous avons parlé des de, 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 de transferts de technologies, nous avons parlé de, de la mobilisation des financements pour mettre en œuvre cet ambitieux programme et bien entendu, le développement des partenariats publics-privés et surtout euh, les, les co-entreprises pour le développement des énergies renouvelables en Côte d'Ivoire. Monsieur le modérateur, je m'excuse d'avoir été un peu long, mais il était important pour nous, avant de parler du développement des énergies renouvelables, de dire un peu quelle est l'ambition de la Côte d'Ivoire de façon globale en termes de développement de ses capacités énergétiques. Je vous remercie. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Sisse. I don't think you took up too much of our time. It was very insightful, very useful. Uh, I, I believe the minister has to step out uh, for, a, for a few minutes, so he'll be back shortly. Uh, we, will so, uh, we will carry on in the meantime with our panel discussion. Um, uh, we will now have Mr. Gurdeep Singh, uh, CMD of the National Thermal Power Corporation. Uh, a quick word about NTPC. Uh, NTPC is India's largest power company with an installed capacity of 51,000 megawatts, which is, uh, of which 65% uh, is owned by the government of India. Um, NTPC has made a commitment of 10,000 megawatts of solar capacity. Uh, it has also made an affirmative commitment towards the ISA efforts. Uh, and currently, NTPC is 12th ranked in the world in terms of overall capacity and 4th in terms of coal-based capacity. Uh, so let me ask uh, Mr. Gurdeep Singh about uh, his plans for Africa and how uh, he can assist in the ISA efforts. Thank you, sir. Uh, Good afternoon. Uh, I think before, uh, thanks for giving little introduction. I think uh, as uh, Sumanth said, uh, we are the largest uh, power generating utility in the country. We have around 51,000 megawatt uh, capacity. It's mainly uh, coal based, but in the last three years, we have embarked on a very generous ambitious journey of adding uh, renewable and that to mainly on the solar side. And uh, in the last uh, few years, we had not only and we are adding capacity, but we had been instrumental in uh, making sure that the, even the private developers come. So we are we are purchasing the, uh, the solar power from the developer and in turn selling it to the distribution utilities. I think I just wanted to mention this one particularly because this was the one of the method where in there was a lot of confidence which could develop in the minds of the private developers and that was one of the way to bring down the cost uh, of the power. I think if I go back around only then about five years in 2011-12, in this state where I was working earlier, it was we had signed the PPA that about, let's say, average uh, price of more than 12 rupees uh, uh, a unit, which has come down in the last bid is around 2 rupees 44 paise. So it's uh, almost uh, one fifth uh, it's, uh, the, the prices have come down. And that has been one of the reasons is that there has been a uh, systematic uh, approach which we had followed and we had gone through the kind of very transparent bidding process and uh, followed by the reverse bidding so that everybody is getting a chance that they can really optimize their, uh, their bids. Uh, 
with this uh, background, I would uh, think that we can, uh, uh, as NTPC, we can, uh, we can uh, really help uh, the different countries uh, to go for the solar programs. And uh, last, uh, lately, then we have taken up another uh, project, which will be very interesting, that in the island of Indom Andom Andaman Nicobar, we are going ahead with uh, battery storage also. This is 17 plus 825 megawatt, which probably will be paving the way for the next round of the development in the solar energy, uh, which can really provide a reliable power. And I hope that with the falling prices in the solar, the similar, uh, there will be price fall in the battery storage, and this will become affordable, reliable uh, power uh, in the in the long run, without uh, depending on the much on the fossil fuel, so we will be in NTPC. We have a very uh, uh, this structured uh, training program. The we, can, we have a consultancy wing, so we can help in uh, kind of uh, capacity building, uh, be it on the technical side, operational side, or the capacity building side. In this is uh, when, whether it's a procurement or the any other system. And uh, we as NTPC would also be looking at whether it's G2G or whether it's a standalone that we can have then some opportunities where uh, we can not only then invest and as a business opportunity, but as Honorable Minister was saying that we had, uh, we will be more than happy to have the partnering and as a, as a partnering countries and we can really uh, help in the uh, providing the power to all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Singh. Uh, may I now request, uh, Mr. Ahmed Saeed Hassani Jafar, uh, His Excellency Vice President of Public of Commerce, please, to make his address. Thank you. Honorable assistance, uh, je vais parler en français, bon, comme uh, mon ami Ivoirien qui est passé par là et Je voulais bon, adresser mes remerciements au ministre, même s'il est, est sorti, mais, mais dire que euh, j'ai compris pourquoi M. Modi l'a désigné comme ministre de l'énergie, parce qu'il a tellement de, de l'énergie. Et je sais que son énergie peut allumer l'Afrique, la, bon, sûrement avec ses programmes. Alors je voulais bon, le remercier, mais d'abord remercier le gouvernement indien euh, pour l'accueil chaleureux que ma délégation... Euh, a, a, a été réservé et puis bon à mon égard aussi mais bon dire que bon on sait de, que l'Inde est un pays qui bon, a une histoire sur euh, euh, l'accueil et sur l'hospitalité ce matin je vais parler énergie pilier de l'économie pilier du développement car comme il est connu aucun développement ne peut prospérer sans l'existence d'une énergie stable et pérenne Je vais aussi essayer de parler un peu de mon pays, les Comores, parce que sûrement l'assistance ne connaît pas ce pays bon, qui est au niveau de l'océan Indien. Cela veut dire que c'est la mer aujourd'hui qui nous sépare entre les Comores et l'Inde. C'est juste six heures de voyage. C'est dire que nous, a, nous, nous, sommes, nous sommes très proches, mais aussi nous sommes éloignés par la mer. Mais aujourd'hui, avec les richesses de la mer, l'Inde et les Comores sont des pays qui sont très proche. D'ailleurs, nous sommes dans une même organisation, euh, l'organisation de l'IORA, euh, qui rassemble bon, ce grand océan indien qui va de l'Afrique du Sud jusqu'à Australie. Alors, euh, les pays africains, à l'instar de mon pays, les Comores, doivent considérer le problème de l'énergie comme prioritaire. Il doit être au centre de toute action et toute stratégie. Mon pays, les Comores, a souffert pendant plus d'une décennie d'une instabilité énergétique. Il y avait des incessantes délestages qui ont rendu notre économie exsangue et il était impossible que le pays puisse décoller dans son économie. Alors, nous, avec le nouveau gouvernement conduit par M. Azali Assoumani, c'est le président de la République, nous avons décidé de mettre l'accent sur l'énergie. Alors, qu'est-ce que nous avons fait Nous avons doté le pays de plusieurs centrales thermiques qui ont permis d'allumer l'ensemble du pays, mais aussi faire fonctionner les moyens et les petites entreprises qui avaient presque fermé. L'économie euh, qui fonctionnait au ralenti depuis a démarré. Et nous avons senti que le quotidien du, Com euh, du Comorien commençait à évoluer. Mais nous, nous avons très vite fait le constat qu'il faut se tourner vers les énergies renouvelables. 
les énergies de demain. Les actions engagées et les projets en cours et à venir doivent viser la sécurité énergétique et un cadre légal propice, mais aussi le renforcement des capacités. Les programmes mis en place doivent se tourner vers la sécurité énergétique, c'est-à-dire une énergie en permanence, disponible et accessible et à bas coût. Il faut donc trouver des solutions et œuvrer à assurer à tout moment les fournitures d'énergie dont les, cons les consommateurs ont besoin. Comme je l'ai évoqué si déçu, mon pays, l'Union des Comores, est entré dans une ère de stabilité qui nous rassure et rassure nos partenaires quant à l'avenir de notre pays. Beaucoup de réformes sont engagées sous euh, l'impulsion du président Azali Assoumani et nous comptons de l'accompagnement d'un grand pays tel l'Inde pour concrétiser les attentes du peuple comorien en matière de développement. De nombreuses initiatives ont été engagées avec l'Inde pour assurer l'accès à l'énergie de façon durable et soutenable sur le long terme. Et nous comptons beaucoup sur ce pays frère et ami pour réussir à relever ce défi. La recherche donc de l'indépendance énergétique est au cœur des priorités du gouvernement comorien. Comme tout le monde le sait, l'énergie est le fer de lance du développement économique et social des nations. L'Union des Comores est un exemple parfait de pays africains sur la voie de développement. Le contexte de notre pays aujourd'hui est celui d'une nation qui cherche à asseoir les bases du développement économique et social. Notre ambition est à la hauteur des défis que nous affrontons. Après la mise en place de nouvelles centrales thermiques afin d'apporter une solution à la crise énergétique sur le court terme, nous sommes aujourd'hui à la recherche de nouveaux partenariats en vue de la mise en place des sources d'énergie durables et respectueuses de l'environnement. Dans un monde de plus en plus confronté aux problèmes de réchauffement climatique et ses conséquences sur la vie dans les petits états insulaires, il est de plus en plus urgent de mobiliser les ressources requises pour solutionner le problème de l'accès à une énergie durable, dont les technologies et les coûts sont souvent hors de la portée des états en développement. En tant qu'État insulaire, les potentialités sont importantes aussi bien pour ce qui est des énergies marines, hydroélectriques et solaires. Mais une des sources d'énergie aujourd'hui qui offre un grand espoir au peuple comorien est la géothermie. L'État comorien y accorde une importance capitale et compte bénéficier de l'appui des partenaires multiformes et, de euh, multiforme et des pays amis, notamment l'Inde. Il faut donc accélérer le processus de mise en place de l'exploitation de cette ressource gisant dans les profondeurs du volcan Kartala. Par ailleurs, notre continent fort d'un partenariat stratégique avec l'Inde et de l'expérience de ce grand pays qui a su nouer avec l'Afrique des relations historiques, d'échanges, doit tirer meilleure partie de la réussite indienne. Je suis convaincu que les nouvelles priorités affichées par l'Inde au plus haut niveau, permettent à nos différents pays d'offrir une lueur d'espoir aux populations africaines. Pour finir, distingué invité, je voudrais adresser mes sincères remerciements au gouvernement indien pour l'accueil chaleureux réservé à ma délégation. Vive la coopération entre l'Inde et les Comores et vive la coopération internationale. Juste pour rappeler à l'assistance qu'hier, les Comores ont signé avec Alliance Solaire Internationale. Nous aussi, nous avons ratifié la convention avec Alliance Solaire Internationale. Thank you. Uh, and that brings us to the end of our session. I'd like to thank all the, all the panelists, the participants. Uh, the ministers, uh, His Excellency, the Vice President of Comoros, uh, for being here with us. Uh, just to make some very final sort of closing comments, I think it's very clear that both, both uh, regions have very large populations, which from an energy standpoint today are fairly underserved. Uh, the, low, uh, the, you know, the low per capita consumption of power, I think, is common in both uh, sets of areas. Uh, India's is 1,000 uh, kilowatt hours per capita. I'm not sure what, the, what it is in Africa. 
but I would imagine it's something pretty similar. Um, and we have humongous room to grow uh, in our energy requirements and development going forward. Uh, and it also therefore gives us an opportunity because as the energy markets worldwide are changing, as generation capacities are likely to move more and more towards renewables, we have the opportunity of actually moving directly into those areas and actually leapfrogging the development of our energy markets uh, in, in ways that are much more modern, much more climate friendly, uh, and better for our future. Um, so I think that is something that is very positive. Uh, there is an also an opportunity for us to cross-pollinate solutions that are developed uh, in either of the regions, whether it's in India getting transferred to Africa, whether developed in Africa getting transferred to India. I think those kinds of opportunities, those kinds of transference of ideas we have to focus on. Um, there could be opportunities also on the financing side, clearly in, uh, for both again can go both ways. And uh, I think one thing that at least for me is coming through very clearly is that we need to have more forums for such interactions. Uh, you know, this is obviously an extremely welcome step to have the African Development Bank uh, here uh, with us, uh, having their annual general session here. Uh, it gives us the opportunity to interact with them. But I think we need also need to now move forward and have more private sector to private sector forums uh, such as this and move beyond the government to government uh, sessions as well. Uh, but, and so therefore hoping for much more such interactions in the future. Um, I would hope that ISA can be maybe perhaps a fulcrum which allows these kinds of interactions to develop and, and become more prominent going forward. Uh, and hoping for such interactions to continue in the future. I'd uh, say thank you to all of you for being patiently uh, here, listening to all of us, and I'd like to thank the participants for being here and taking part in this discussion. Thank you, thank you all.